Today, I want to introduce you to my new membership program that consists of five levels where you can invest in the Green Gorilla channel on a monthly basis and receive level-specific perks. Memberships are special because they improve the quality of the content of the channel and will help me to be able to keep the channel going. Now, to participate in the Green Gorilla channel membership program, all you have to do is hit the Join button, which is located right next to the Subscribe button on my channel page. Now, for all of my subscribers who decide not to participate in my membership program, nothing will change. The content will keep coming the way it always has. Thanks for watching, and be careful out here, people. Bless. Now, I can't go into the history of gangs. If you want to have a deep understanding about the origin of gangs in the United States, first of all, gangs weren't started by black folks, not in the United States. The gangs have been here. If you want a deep and a thoroughgoing understanding of how the gangs developed in the black community, go watch Bastards of the Party. It's on YouTube. You can go look at it. You can see it. It's right there for you to see. Because black people moved from down south, they moved to the Midwest and they moved out west, and when they went there, they encountered white gangs. Like the spook hunters. So what these black boys did was they banded together and founded gangs of their own in order to protect themselves from the onslaught of violence from the white gangs. So that's how they started. Now men are naturally going to group together in packs anyway. And they're gonna issue insults and compete with one another anyway. That's what they're going to do. But somehow, this competition in our community, and not to say it hadn't happened in other communities. I mean, look at the Italians, look at the Russians, the Chinese, the Japanese, Yakuza, the, like the, the triads. I've been over this before. But typically, the violence doesn't spill over to family members. Typically, it doesn't happen, but it's happening now. We got a thug in a welfare culture, a culture bereft of value and an ethos. And how did it happen? How did it develop? Now I can spew off a whole bunch of bullshit from my mouth, but this is something I've actually taken the time to study. It's not something that I'm pulling out of my anus. I've studied this. So what I'm about to take you through is my study about this. To understand how we came to this place. And why it seems like we can't get out of this place. And some of the words I use may be big words but they're not false words. And if you have a difference of an opinion, come tell me, speak to me. You don't have to get on another show and do a show about it. Speak to me about it. But this is the value of having somebody who actually studies shit in the sphere. So you can have an understanding of how things came to pass, how they have come to be how they are. It's necessary. So let me just get right into it, man. Let me just say what it is. So you can understand it, man. So you can know how it came to be, how it came to pass. Now I'm gonna tell you this, the main drive behind labeling black men as thugs and black women as welfare queens really has ties to slavery. Because prior to that, black people were not even thought to be different than white folks at all. 
I mean, of course, there were prejudices and chauvinism amongst different people from different cultures, but it wasn't like it is now. That didn't exist. Now, of course, look, African people are phenotypically different than white folks. I mean, we got brown skin. They have pasty white skin. We have woolly hair. They have lanky hair. But this didn't stop people, even in the colonies, from eating, sleeping, socializing. They even ran away together under the harsh and the oppressive conditions of indentured servitude and slavery. They even took up arms with one another which they did during Bacon's Rebellion. I don't know if you've heard of Bacon's Rebellion, but let that be firmly implanted in your brain and go do some research and some study about it. They joined forces, indentured servants and slaves, in 1676 in order to challenge the oppression from the planter class. They did that. But the planter class, they were stunned by this alliance. And they developed a strategy to neutralize it. And so what they did was they used the balkanization technique, divide and conquer. And they offered white people a bribe. As long as whites promised to keep their sable fellows in check, they would be granted an honorific status above them and would be regarded as wage earners instead of slaves. Now, of course, there's always going to be differences and nuances and subtleties related to this because there were free black people. But by and large, in the United States, prior to 1865, the Emancipation Proclamation, black people, the bulk of them were slaves, three fifths of people. So with a wave of a wand, whites were placed in a higher social category than that of black folks. So it was then from there on asserted that black skin and woolly hair were devilish traits and revealed a natural taint. And it was a lie. It was cooked up for the sake of justifying the institution of slavery and for separating the mutual economic interest of black and white laborers. And it began to stand on its own legs and it persists today through the myth of the black thug and the welfare queen. Namely that these people are somehow inherently fucked up. That they're making, you know, all kinds of vicious decisions. And many of them are. Viciousness is not something though that's monopolized by the black population. Look at all the fucking shit, the violence that fomented in the mafia during the era of prohibition. Look at war in the world and ask if there's collateral damage in war. I just heard a group of men have an argument about Iwo Jima and Nagasaki. America said, fuck it. Primarily when those bombs were dropped, civilians were killed. So if you want to know the truth about how this shit started, I can tell you. I can tell you. Now, if you disagree, come on the show. I beg of you. Bring that ass here, boy, and we can have a conversation about it. But if you don't want to have an informed conversation and a respectable conversation, get the fuck on down the road, man, because I'm not about to play them kind of games. I'm not about to go through that. I'm not about to do that, man. Only real shit. Now, let me tell you, there's a, a, a thinker, a, a, a sociologist, his name is Loic Waquant, and he wrote an article, it's entitled, From Slavery to Mass Incarceration, Rethinking the Rest que uh, Race Question in the United States. And he says, the first three peculiar institutions 
and they're called peculiar for a reason. Slavery, Jim Crow, and the ghetto have one thing in common. They were all instruments for the conjoint extraction of labor and social ostracization. That's what they were created for. All of them. We want free labor and we're going to set you aside from the body of people that live here. These are the facts. This is academic, man. There is shit tons of literature on this subject, man. This ain't shit that I'm cooking up and pulling up out my ass. They were designed with the express intent of exploiting black labor and creating an almost impenetrable form of social cleavage. So let's be, let's be specific so we can understand it. So you can get it. Slavery was an agrarian based economic institution that exploited unfree black labor and developed a, ra a racial caste system. Jim Crow was a set of bigoted laws and cultural norms established for the purpose of the same, exploiting black labor and for continuing the practice of partitioning blacks apart from the social body. Ghettoization is not that much different than slavery and Jim Crow. The ghettos were actually created for the sake of quarantining what they call alterity, difference, while exploiting black men and women doing labor shortages. Now, this mechanism of marginalization and exploitation though, as effective as it was during the industrial phase of America, it's increasingly ineffective at managing the growing horde of hopeless poor persons, urban poor persons, created by America's new economic policies. We have a post Fordist. If you don't know what Fordist economics is, go look the shit up. Henry Ford, he developed a form of industry where the people who work for him actually could make a goddamn living wage is what he did. But those situations, those conditions are gone. They're over with. We don't have a Fordist economy anymore. This is an austere neoliberal economy, service-based. Is what it is. So that cultural vision is gone. It's over with, it's done. But the consensus, and it doesn't matter if it's left or right, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether you're elephant or an ass, it doesn't matter. The consensus by both of these groups, and you can tell by the people who are making the laws and the policies and how they affect black men in particular, and also women, you'll see the effects of this shit. How do you deal with the, the Negro problem? Well, you manage black male bodies through the penal sector of the state and you manage black female bodies through paternalistic administrative bureaucracies. Welfare shit. That's how it's done, bruh. If you must know. So the first thing I'm gonna do is talk to you about how they do it with black men and then I'll talk about how they manage black women. They're managing both of us. Because the few people who get the set aside, now you see all this shit about, well, black women being given incentives and, and, and help and aid and programs and all of this stuff. It's only for a few token women. The vast majority of us still live in these ghettos. Or some form of it. Now I'll tell you, the black ghetto is not the way that it was prior to the civil rights movement. It doesn't bear any resemblance to it other than in name. I'm going to tell you why. 
because right now you got a tightening of wage labor you got a diminishment of welfare protection for real and then you got the increased use of penalization as a means of social control and that what that means is the ghetto is becoming more and more like a prison that's the facts they're increasingly becoming more and more the ghetto is it, it's more and more like a prison so what you what you got is a triple relationship between what's almost functionally equivalent structurally homologous and culturally syncretic which means ultimately it serves the same purpose it's basically in the same form and it has the same value system so the ghetto is the prison now that's the facts man look at the values being espoused by all the people there it's jail culture bruh i know it I've been through it. I know jail culture when I see it. And that's black culture right now in the ghetto. These are the facts, man. They are like a continuum and it entraps a redundant population of young black men who circulate in a closed circuit between its two poles in a self-perpetuating cycle of social and legal marginality with devastating personal and social consequences now it's important for you to understand that the way that the carceral state the prison state is used to control uh, control the black population that ain't nothing new it's not new man because directly after emancipation and reconstruction, a law and order rhetoric, uh, rhetoric was devised. That's what they came up with first. As soon as it was over with slavery, okay, now it's time to get law and order. And it served the purpose of justifying the use of penal institutions to exploit newly freed black folks and to keep them in their place. So you got throngs of blacks who were once required to be subservient by law who are now instantaneously given the same rights as their previous owners. They can own guns, they can vote, they can engage in enterprise. Now this really bothered a lot of these folks, man. Really pissed them off. And it really bothered the Southern aristocracy. And they were afraid that revenge would be taken out against them. Now I don't know what you know about slavery but this idea that it was all kumbaya, they were all close and cool and shit. Yeah, maybe if you was a house nigga tap dancing, maybe that. Maybe if you was doing the, 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 the tap dance shuffle. That wasn't a positive situation for us, man. And I'm starting to hear a lot of people, you know, like act like that situation was cool. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that fucked up. In the manosphere? Really? I can't believe it, man. I just don't get it. I can't really fathom it. I don't understand it. I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm in a loss of words because I can't understand it. So you got all these black folks who are now able to have guns, vote, and do all this other stuff. They're actually able to own businesses and get money and to make money. But it didn't just bewilder the Southern aristocracy, it bewildered poor white people who had taken the racial bribe. They took it, bruh. They took it. These are the facts. They became accustomed to the racial caste system and a symbolic set of privileges that they got from it. So it had to be strange to them. This white folks to see their niggers 
who are no longer following their rules and their customs, their mores related to racial etiquette. And they were no longer acting and behaving like they were supposed to. Something had to be done. We got to do something. Something's got to be done about this. The solution, criminalize black life itself. Now, when you start to create a condition like this, it becomes self-fulfilling and self-preserving. And a lot of people don't want to talk about that. They just want to talk about personal responsibility and choices and decisions. Yeah, decisions in the context of what? Decisions in the context of what? Pathology? How can you become anything but pathological if you're thoroughly immersed in pathology? Explain the shit. Now there's gonna be a few people who are able to escape the clutches of the pathology. But if you live and grow up in a fucking functional equivalent of a prison, what kind of values are you gonna to begin to adopt and extol? Which ones? So then at that time, right after slavery, you got Southern legislators and they drafted new laws that targeted black people for the express purpose of controlling and managing their existence. You had pig laws, vagrancy laws, laws against walking too close to the railroad, laws against speaking too loud in the presence of white women, laws against loitering. It goes on and on and on. And they're indicative of the kind of unjust statues that were contrived in cities and counties all over the South for the purpose of returning blacks to a condition as close to slavery as possible. Now, although slavery was outlawed, it was not outlawed in cases where people were convicted of felonies. The penal system with this practice of convict leasing became an institution that supplied the continued exploitation and management of black male bodies. Now the difference between the law and order rhetoric of America's past and its implementation today, or implementation today is that in the past it served two purposes. Of justifying exploitation and marginalization. But today, because of market deregulation, mechanization, welfare downsizing, the outsourcing of labor, law and order rhetoric, and the imagery of black male thuggery primarily serve the purpose of social ostracization and the devaluation of black male life. Do black men do fucked up shit? Absolutely. But what's some of the reasons for how this shit came to be? And why does it seem like it's almost impossible to get out of? It? And just don't don't forget now, it ain't just black people that blow up people houses, bruh. And kill babies and shit. We're talking about the creation of thugs. How you take a group of people who are known primarily as Uncle Ben, Uncle Tom, mammies and shit like that and turn them into thugs. If we learn thug shit, we learn it from these motherfuckers because they're the original thugs, man. Let's just be honest about that shit. But nobody wants to have an honest, open, and a candid conversation about that shit. It's time to drop a bomb on them. Talk about murdering grandmas and grandpas and babies and shit. But we lose sight of that though. We don't, oh well, you know, it's the choices we make. Yeah, it's, it's some fucked up choices we making and I take full responsibility for people being responsible. I get it. But if you wanna understand the conditions out of which this shit came, then you gotta look at it from an academic perspective. All that pseudo-scientific mumbo jumbo, American virtuous bullshit is some bullshit. I just gotta speak on it and tell the truth about it. Somebody gotta tell the truth about it. Otherwise,
Now, the expansion of the penal state is just basically a way in the law and order propaganda, it's a way to get rid of the annoying and the dispensable black male bodies. That's what it is. The contemporary penal state or system in the US is functionally equivalent to the ghetto because it uses controlled violence to restrict and contain a dishonored group of people. That's how it's functionally equivalent. How is it homologous? It can basically it comforts the same types of dominating and oppressive social relationships. And it's culturally welded to the ghetto in that it upholds several of the functions of the, the penal state, the ghetto does. But the chief problem, the biggest problem with the relationship between the ghetto and the penal state is that the ghetto is no longer able to serve the dual function that it once was able to serve for black people. And you might think, well, what good could have ever come out of the ghetto? Well, it is a way to carve a dishonored group off of the social body. It is. It's also a means though, by which that dishonored group can bond to protect itself. But with the rise of mass incarceration, the ghetto is actually moving. It's permutating into a hyper ghetto. And it no longer encourages that bonding and collective protection. See, the reality of the black hyper ghetto can best be understood by distinguishing it from the traditional communal black ghetto. Because you used to have a communal black ghetto. Me and Sand Dog was talking about this the other day. Number one, the hyper ghetto is comprised of a homogeneous population of uneducated and unemployed black folks. But the ghetto of the 20th century, I'm talking about the 1900s, the early 1900s, was integrated along class lines. Poor and, and, and rich black people lived together in the ghetto in the early 20th century. That doesn't happen anymore. Because people who give money, the first thing they do is they rush to get out. These are the facts. Now, if you tell me, tell me I'm lying. Explain to me how the fuck I'm lying right here. And if you, if you think I'm lying, go get the evidence. Number two, the hyper ghetto is merely a repository of unwanted black bodies. But the ghetto of the 20th century was a reservoir for cheap labor. Number three, the hyper ghetto is filled with top down bureaucratic agencies that custodialize and survey every nook and cranny of black life but the communal ghetto of the 20th century was filled with a whole bunch of self-made black institutions that parallel those of prosperous white Americans. And finally, the hyper ghetto offers no buffering protection from a dominating and oppressive police state, but the communal ghetto of the 20th century, or excuse me, the 19th, in the 20, early 20th century offers some solace in the form of a safe space where decent black folk wouldn't be harassed by hostile white people. That's no longer the case. So you got two worlds that are colliding. They are colliding, bruh. And they're becoming increasingly indistinguishable. The ghetto and the prison. And the ghetto begins to take on the characteristics of the prison and vice versa. This is what 
Waquant, he's an ethnographer and a sociologist. He calls it deadly symbiosis. And it's virtually destroying the black community, man. And let's not get it twisted, man. The prison is increasingly divided along racial lines and gang affiliations. But once people went to prison, they just wanted to do that time and get the fuck out. Now, the code of the streets and gang violence is beginning to permeate the reality of prison life to such an extent that inmates are finding it difficult to do their own time. You got to take sides. You got to be part of a clique or a gang or some shit like that. Because a lot of inmates are pressured by threats of violence to take sides in contraband wars. Just like the shit on the street. And the role of the prison as an instrument for rehabilitation has been replaced. People don't get sent to prison to get rehabilitated. The penitentiary, the root of it is penitence. Or penance. to serve time and to be done with it. That shit don't happen today. It's a form of social exclusion today. The, oh, do you have a record? Man, back in the day in the West, if you get out of jail, they give you your fucking gun, get you on your horse, send you on your way. Today we get involved in doxing and cancel culture and shit like that. Oh, I wanna look into your background. Who the fuck got a perfect and rosy and a goddamn clear and clean background? Huh? Who the fuck got that? Show me so I can burn your motherfucking ass to flames. Because it's a lie. Ain't nobody working this God green earth perfect. Ain't nobody perfect, man. Nobody in this bitch is perfect. We all got dirt underneath our fingernails, bruh. And you might not have broke the law, but you done done some shit you ain't supposed to do. And ain't no goddamn gone human being that's alive that ain't done some shit that they ain't supposed to do, bruh. Nobody. Nobody. No, it's true. I, 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 it's true. Mass incarceration is different than slavery. It is. It's different than Jim Crow. It's different than the ghetto. But it's functionally similar to them in very many respects. They each basically confirm that black people bear an inextinguishable taint, the curse of ham. And it justifies their social and political exclusion. The exploitative element of black labor is gone because there's no need for it anymore. We didn't already built the motherfucker up. I tell you, and I'm going to tell you again. Oh, I told you. I told you. The first capitalist institution, the very first, was slavery. Those are the facts. Now, if you don't believe it, go fucking check it out and read. I'm telling you. Go read. The first is capitalism and slavery connected. But before then, you had what was called mercantilism. The first capitalist enterprise was a whole bunch of white folks trying to get black people to perform menial labor for them for free forever. It was more lucrative than the dope trade ever was or ever will be or any scamming or any other kind of illicit activity that you could think about engaging in. 
They made 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 times the profit of their investment of working us to the fucking C to C. The West got powerful and came to ascendancy because of it. It wasn't that they were virtuous, they worked hard. If they was working so goddamn hard, why ain't they do the shit they motherfucking self? Why ain't they do it they goddamn self? What they need us for? They so goddamn virtuous and hard working and shit. Seem like it'd be pretty fucking easy to get a motherfucker to do all the work I need around my house while I sit with my feet up worrying about how I can manage their labor. But that's just my opinion though. The difference between mass incarceration and Jim Crow and slavery and ghettoization is that the prior institutions exploited black labor and cleaved blacks off from the social body. But the current system of mass incarceration exploits black labor creatively and circuitously in a circle through the proliferation of the prison industrial complex. Because there's money in that shit, bruh. It's money in policing. It's money in prisons. They already know how many people they need in prisons by the way people perform on reading examinations. They already got it mapped out. He can't be part of the economy. That motherfucker's gonna work outside of the context of it. Get that motherfucker a bed ready. Get him a hot and uh, some hot center cot ready. They got private prisons, man. You can go into business and buy a prison. And we ain't the ones judging each other and sending each other to prison and judging each other and punishing each other. It's these white motherfuckers that's doing this shit. That's why I was telling Sand Dog the other day, we don't have any control, no manly control, because men issue judgment and it sticks and they have power to make it stick. Now, I'm not saying get rid of the police. That's not what I'm saying, bro. All I'm saying is if we have a system whereby we have an ethos and we judge and assess each other's character and issue reward and praise, punishment and blame, then we would be doing some shit. But we leaving for these motherfuckers who we know don't love us to take care of it for us. Those are the facts. That's the reality. Now we can talk about how we got here and what we can do to change it. Some of you motherfuckers don't want it to change because it, it would require some effort and some work on your behalf. But most of y'all don't want to do that shit at all. You just want a profession, some pussy, and a PlayStation. Sorry if you got to hear it harsh like that, but I don't give a fuck. I don't care, man. I'm going to keep it 100. I said it was straight up no chaser. Don't like it, man. Get the fuck on down the road, man. It is what it is. Now, I don't say get rid of the police, but God damn, man. Some of the shit that they're doing is out of bounds, bruh. You keep sending people to prison. You keep taking people out of prison, putting them back into the ghetto. What the fuck you think you're gonna get, man? Huh? What do you think you're gonna be left with? 
and all the black people who actually are able to fucking enter into professions, they don't want to have shit to do with it. What you think is going to happen? I'm just answering the question. But yes, the prison industrial complex does exploit black labor through a revolving door of publicly funded military style policing and draconian sentencing and the warehousing of black bodies. Yes, it does that. If you look at the numbers, who's the bulk of the people there? Now I already told you again elsewhere, black people are no more likely to use and to sell dope than any other group of people. Where do you think opium came from? Didn't come from fucking Africa. I ain't know they had poppy fields and shit like that in Africa. Last time I checked, the shit was in Asia. The last time I checked, when I looked at the opium laws, they were ways to discriminate against the Asians, the Chinese in particular. You wanna know where cocaine come from? Comes from America, the coca leaf. All this shit was used by these cultures, man, for centuries, bruh. The active ingredient of Coca-Cola was cocaine. Have a Coke and a smile. The moral fabric of society didn't fucking fall apart at the seams when Coca-Cola had cocaine in it. It just didn't. It did not. The most, the, the face, the poster child of drug use in America prior to the advent of all of these laws that restrict the use of drugs along with alcohol which by the way, alcohol is the most dangerous drug known to man. And a lot of y'all motherfuckers drink a lot of alcohol. It kills more people and causes more accidents and more violence than all of the other drugs combined. These are facts. If you want to debate, come holler at me. I know what I'm talking about. I done researched the shit. Go look at Carl Hart, high price. Go read the book. Go look at the statistics on alcohol versus other related deaths, uh, related to what, what do they call it? Illicit drugs. Shit, prescription painkillers is killing more motherfuckers combined with alcohol than all the other illicit drugs combined. And all of this was done under the so-called war on drugs. So police departments all over America began to use SWAT teams with paramilitary tactics, no knock raids, flashbang grenades, battering rams, capturing seeds. You would think it was an actual fucking war. You got kids in the house, man, with small amounts of dope, and they battering the shit in like it's a goddamn military operation in Iraq or Afghanistan. And once you get booked, municipal, state, federal courts, jail and in prison, convicted felons and nonviolent drug dealers, because not all of them are violent and attach hefty restitutions to their sentencing statements and release arrangements. If the offender can't pay it, they're sent back to prison. In addition to being subjected to military style occupation by the police, and I ain't knocking police, I'm just saying some of the tactics are fucked up as it pertains to how they act and how they move in the black community. I got some close friends and associates and frat brothers that's police. And they know what's fucked up and what's bad and good about their own institution.
So you got economic exploitation and ostracization taking place at the same time, but doing shit that everybody in the country is fucking doing. It's more dope in Harvard and Yale than, than in the motherfucking Atlanta Bankhead. Guaranteed. But you don't want to hear that though. And it's a long list of public and private corporations that make use of prison labor for profit. That's a fact. If you want to know how we got here. If you want to know how we got here, I'm telling you, I'm giving you the whole shit. The whole kid and caboodle. And the media exploits black labor through the proliferation of hypersexualized thug imagery. I've been going over the whole series on the media, the six big ones that are anti-black misandrists. I've been doing that. But they don't just do that. You got news outlets that sell advertisement space by fomenting racial xenophobia and paranoia. They basically got sexy and titillating stories about, you know, crack bust-ins and Pookie and Ray Ray fucking up. They ain't telling you about Jethro and Billy Bob. But they got higher rates of drug use than we do. Go look it up, man. Go see it for yourself. White people, white men in particular, are more likely to have used hard, illicit drugs than black men. These are facts. That's data, empirical data. But then you got people like Rush Limbaugh in the past, Bill O'Reilly. They had careers based off that shit. Race baiting. Playing on white people's racial sensitivities and fears. You got record, television, film production companies. And they draw their fair share of profits from it too. Presenting black males as violent, ignorant, and hypersexualized criminals. But unfortunately, the black men who sing, rap, and dance on these records are complicit in their own exploitation and debasement. That's fucked up, but it is what it is. Time to send out a fucking cluster strike on that shit. Honeycomb Brazy. See, what black men have done is, I guess they said, fuck it. We got to make money somehow. If we got to make money doing this shit, we going to act like it's real and do the Daffy Dance. You say that's what we got to do, make some money, boss? Well, let's do it. We ought to make some money, boss. No, I'm not, look, I'm not knocking that man. Because human beings are violent all over the planet. This is just a fact. Male, female, black, white, red, brown, whatever the fuck, people are violent, man. These are the facts. I'm not sitting here trying to have an exercise and how fucked up the black community is. It is fucked up. But I'm trying to explain to you how we got here. If you must know and how hard it'll be to get out of it. Now, I don't know opinions. I mean, everything is to some degree an opinion, but you know, some opinions are better than others. I just think I, I have to admit that shit right there. Just is what it is. Some opinions are formed through years of painstaking research and investigation, and some people are just pulling shit out of their motherfucking ass. 
time bomb. Because black men portraying themselves as gangsters and thugs for profit, they become the contemporary equivalent of minstrels. That's a problem. But the unfortunate consequence of this modern day minstrelsy is many black men in the hyper ghettos have begun to wholeheartedly identify themselves as those who deride, kill, and exploit them as essentially criminals and thugs through what I call the negative evaluation of honor. Many black men are attempting in vain to flip the script on crim uh, criminality through the wholesale co-optation of the criminal image. It's like trying to co-opt the word nigga. Oh, so, you know, we're going to use nigga because we're going to take the sting off of it. So we call each other niggas, then somebody else calls a nigga and they going to make us feel like we nigga. So it's a logic that says if you're going to be perceived as a criminal, you may as well be the best damn criminal you could be. Now the problem of this self-deprecation is exposed by the rapper Tupac like back in the day when I was coming up, who painfully recites the truth about black ghetto youths. One of the most popular songs off his record, uh, All Eyes On Me, the album, man. He say he wanna be, he say he gonna be, he say he wanna be, shorty wanna be a thug. The sad thing is many black boys have ambitions to be thugs. And hoodlums. Remember two chains, the dope man, my motherfucking role model. Not Tiger, not George, not Charles Barkley. Really? The dope man, your, bo your role model, huh? Now, look, the dope man's respect comes from his ability to carve out an opulent living apart from the system. In the midst of cruel, even harsh structural conditions. But no matter how you try to spin thug imagery and lore, the tragic fact remains, you can't sublimate that shit. It's not gonna result in a healthy and a positive self image, man. It's not. It's not. Now we got here through the creation of these ghettos. And a lot of people look at me and they say, well, didn't the ghettos just come up? It wasn't that just how they, they were like black people just did it themselves? No, they didn't. No, they did not. The ghettos were created by zoning laws, redlining, restrictive covenants, not, uh, no access to federal housing act uh, money and subsidization. See, white people got a lot of social subsidies. When they first came to this motherfucker, they got the Homestead Act. Free land. All you gotta do is just sit on it. It's yours. Isn't that fucking nice? FHA loans. They gave people loans cheaper than the rent they were paying to stay in the slums. Well, you can own a house. Or they got the GI Bill. Black people didn't get the GI Bill. Black men coming home from these wars were restricted from being able to get those monies and to apply them to having real estate. Because local and state governments were the ones that administered the approval of those loans. So how do you get out of that? How do you get out of that? By taking the ethos of dope dealing? 
and getting out of it. This is where we are today, man. You got the prison that's like the ghetto, the ghetto that's like the prison, and it's a revolving door. The values of the prison are now deeply and thoroughly embedded in the family life in the ghetto. And all the well-to-do blacks, they don't wanna have shit to do with it. But in the early 20th century, blacks and you know the wealthy and the people from the poor classes, they lived amongst each other and they didn't destroy and kill each other. They kept each other balanced. Now you talk about that. Motherfucker, the first thing black men gonna say, oh, I, 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 my responsibility. I'm just telling you how it was. Because back then you couldn't have a, a, a integrate, you couldn't move where white people live. And to be perfectly honest, if you look at the segregation, uh, the segregation patterns of residencies, you'll find that they're still similar to what they were prior to desegregation. The school system is the same way. I see Mogul uh, Mogul May says that. Is it fucked up? It is. Is it messed up? Yes, it is. It's fucked up. It's messed up. Does it need to change? Yes. But the solutions we offering, well, you know, just work hard. Just, you know, come on, man. This shit was created by centuries of tinkering and management. And you expect for it to just dissolve overnight? And keep it 100, I'll see you in here. Shout out to him. I know you might disagree with some of the shit that I'm saying, but I, I gotta just lay the facts out there. I'm not like, I'm not playing games with this, bro. We gotta talk real about this. We gotta analyze this. And I'm not deleting any of your comments. I got a bot. So if you get, if you can't see it, you can't see me, sorry. Uh, you, you know, your, your comment doesn't come to the fore, sorry. But these are the facts, man. Times are different. The ghetto is not like it used to be. And I could talk about the welfare component about it, but I'm gonna leave that for tomorrow because I'm already an hour and 15 minutes in. But I'll start off by telling you this about welfare, if you must know, if, you, if I had to get you started and to pique your interest about it. In the early 1940s, there was a, a board it was called the National Resources Planning Board. Go look it up. National Resources Planning Board. They wanted to develop a program for post-war, World War II, economic growth and security. So they developed some policy initiatives. And it ended up being manifest into two bills. You had the Wagner-Murray-Dingle bills of 1943 and 1945. But they never saw the floor of Congress. Now with these bills, the National Resources Planning Board and other New Deal advocates, because the New Deal was a social program for white people. Social welfare for white folks that created a white middle class. That's how it happened. 
didn't happen because they're so fucking hardworking and virtuous. These motherfuckers were given a leg up by the federal fucking government, man. These are the facts, bruh. Real fucking talk, man. We just gotta be real about this shit. They was living in slums before then, man. They ain't have no lights or no water like we didn't have just few a few days ago in Texas. They had to take them people and through government subsidy, lift them out of the condition of poverty. And they did it. And these the same motherfuckers like Martin Luther King Jr. said, telling other people, you need to lift yourself up by your motherfucking bootstraps. Come on, man. What kind of bullshit is this, man? You ain't virtuous enough. You ain't worked hard enough. You ain't put in enough. You just a lazy nigga. That's the same shit they been saying to us from the fucking beginning while we was picking that goddamn cotton, man. Now, are there some lazy niggas? I'm sure there are. But come on, man. The whole fucking race, man, are lazy motherfuckers, man. Really? The, uh, 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 Damn near the entire race of black motherfuckers is just lazy. I find that fucking hard to believe, man. I don't find it to be true or accurate at all about who we are as a group of people. Even motherfuckers that live in the ghetto, man. Cause to let the truth be told, the vast majority of people that live in the fucking ghetto are hardworking people, man. And they have jobs and they abide by the law. They might smoke their little weed, do their little illicit shit, but so does every fucking body else, including motherfuckers who work at these goddamn universities and these goddamn colleges. In case you didn't know. Time for a bomb. That's the reality. So with these two bills, 1943 and 45, they wanted to frame welfare as a broad form of public insurance designed to mitigate a vast constellation of social, structural, and economic problems. But the fiscal conservatives in Congress, lack of support from labor unions, and an increase of middle-class entitlements for World War II veterans signaled doom for any chance of these bills passing. You had conservative congressmen on both sides of the aisle and they formed loose coalitions that effectively blocked the growth of post-war social welfare programs which they perceived as dangerous threats to free enterprise and negative liberty. That's just what they said. You got the labor unions, the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, uh, Labor, and the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. They pulled financial and lobbying support from comprehensive social welfare reform as they secured bread and butter contracts for themselves and their members via private deals with corporations. Also, you get congressional and administrative focus on middle class entitlements, such as the GI Bill, and it drew attention, which black people weren't able to get, and it drew attention away from the needy and poor and directed it towards the creation and expansion of a select middle class. We weren't part of the middle class's growth. It wasn't in the fucking plans. They did everything they could to prevent us from being able to be members of the middle class and we still got motherfuckers in it. Still got doctors and lawyers. Still got police officers and judges. Still got firemen. 
and scientists. That's why I rock with old school shit. I don't listen to these new, the, the, the fucking late 90s. I, li I listen to the 89, the 90s. It takes the nations of millions to hold us back shit. Public enemy in that shit. Farrakhan. And I'm gonna talk more about welfare tomorrow. But see, welfare for these women, when it was never intended to go to single mothers. It was only intended for widows. But they expanded it to deal with single mothers on account of the kids, so to say, so to speak. That's how all this bread and butter shit with this ghetto shit in the hood, how it came to be. But don't, it is the case, don't say that white people ain't been given no motherfucking social programs. That's just not true. They fucking were ushered in to fucking gimmies and grab them. And got set on their feet. Those are the facts. GI Bill, FHA, Homestead, land grant colleges, all kinds of shit they was given. To this day, they give farmers subsidies. This is just the truth, man. A lot of give thems and grab thems You think they turned it down? Because they was living in goddamn sheds and shacks and shit. Enga engaged in the same pathology that we were or that we are now. Do these young motherfuckers need to wake up and grow up and smell the coffee? Absolutely. Are they culpable and do they need to be punished for the shit that they do? Absolutely. But you're gonna see more shit like this, especially if the prison is more like the ghetto and the ghetto is more like the prison. You're going to continue to see it. It ain't gonna get no better. Especially if you're not identifying the real source of the fucking problem. Those are the facts. And if anyone, if any of you think that I'm lying about it or think that I'm off in my assessment or my evaluation, feel free to come and say what you got to say. I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting. 